Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Ramsey Center lecture series for 2023, or in fact, lecture and conversation series, as we do both, and this is a conversation. Um, I'm Simon Haynes, and I'm here with my Ramsey Center colleague, Dr. Stephen McInerney, to talk about liberal education and the great books with a very special guest, and I will introduce her in just a second. But perhaps first just a reminder that uh, if you're interested in this topic, you can see online that I spoke about it uh, on the same broad theme late last year, um, speaking with Professor Roosevelt Montas at Columbia University. Uh, he's the author of the wonderful book, Rescuing Socrates, uh, and the long-term director of their famous core curriculum at, uh, at Columbia. And what I was saying to Roosevelt at the time was that this was a conversation very close to our hearts at the Ramsey Center because the Columbia program was one of the basic models for the undergraduate degrees that we've established in partnership with three terrific Australian universities, um, uh, Wollongong, University of Queensland, and the Australian Catholic University. So that's been very important to us. But actually, there has been an even more influential model in our minds, a college that, in fact, Professor Montas himself was formally uh, attached to, and where our guest today is the, or has been, the head of the Graduate Institute for quite some years. And this is St. John's College in Annapolis in Maryland, uh, a college that we at the Ramsey Center have worked very closely with since our foundation, um, sending a number of our postgraduate scholars there over the last few years. This is one of America's oldest tertiary institutions, dating back to the end of the 17th century, in fact, in its earlier incarnation. But since the 1920s, this has been one of America's most distinguished liberal arts slash great books colleges. That in itself is a distinction that we'll be talking about a bit uh, today. So our guest for this conversation today is Dr. Emily Brooker Langston. And she has been a member of the faculty at St. John's College since 1995. Dr. Langston holds master's degrees from Oxford University and the University of Chicago. She has a PhD from Emory University, where she was a Jacob K. Javits Fellow. And before assuming her role as head of the Graduate Institute in 2015, which she's recently stepped down from, she taught throughout the multidisciplinary um, undergraduate program at St. John's. And Emily has been particularly interested in efforts to expand and democratize access to discussion-based liberal education. She serves on the advisory council of the Touchstones Discussion Project and the board of the Great Questions Foundation. And she's been involved in the development and implementing of educational programming for K-12 schools, for community colleges, and for government and non-government organizations, including the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the Aspen Institute. So, Emily Langston, thank you so much for joining us. We've really been looking forward to this conversation. And what we're going to do is try to draw you out a little bit on what kind of place St. John's College is, what kind of a degree this really is, what makes it, what makes this kind of program so unique. So, first of all, welcome to you. Uh, and I'm going now to hand over to my colleague Stephen McInerney to take us through uh, these and other questions. Thanks, Simon. And hello again, Emily. Hello. I might uh, begin uh, by exploring how it, how it is, how it was, that each, each of us came to be an advocate for liberal education. And uh, Emily, I, I know Simon's just given us a, a very comprehensive introduction uh, to your background in liberal education, but I wonder if you could perhaps give us um, your personal journey to this point, how it was that you came to, to be um, a spokeswoman for, for the liberal arts and liberal education and the great books. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, I didn't. I didn't start out with this as um, as something that I had in mind that I wanted to. I wanted to do. I really um, started out on a more traditional sort of scholarly path. Um, 
I majored in English and minored in philosophy as an undergraduate. And I moved forward um, and was working on a PhD um, on you know, a particular scholarly topic on the work of Emmanuel Levinas. And I was enjoying it very much and um, feeling, you know, feeling the value of it. But at the same time, um, I f was feeling more and more sort of narrowed, narrowed down as I, as I pursued that course. I felt like there were so many other things that were, that are interesting in the world. And I was being asked to, you know, cut my interest in all of the other things off and really bur burrow down on Levinas and my particular angle on that, because really that's what the university system rewards. It rewards, you know, scratching out of, of a narrow area in which you become an expert and publishing in that. And that's a perfectly, you know, um, good sort of activity, but it was leaving me feeling as though the world was such a big and interesting place, and I was just being asked to focus more than I wanted to. So when I um, found out about St. John's College, and I found out that they were hiring, and I realized that there was an institution that would actually pay me to um, <laughs> learn about mathematics, and to learn ancient Greek, and to uh, you know read War and Peace, and to talk about all of these things with a group of colleagues and a group of students over a number of years. Um, I couldn't believe it. I didn't. It wasn't anything I had even been looking for, but I stumbled upon it, and I thought, "Wow, this is really you know this is for me. I hope they let me do it." <laughs> and so. Um, it was the only place I applied to for a job in my first sort of round of um, of applications to teach at universities. And I thought, well, if I don't get this one, then I'll, you know, I'll publish a couple more articles and I'll go out on the job market again the next time around. Um, but luckily, uh, they took me on and um, I've been here very happily since 1995. It's not the sort of thing you get tired of, I find. Um, reading these books and delving deeper and deeper into them and into the conversations that they inspire. That's fascinating. So actually, you're, you're charting here a, a path that we've all been on, which is as we as it were, do further and further study, uh, our focus becomes narrower and narrower. Um, and it's an interesting move to make at the point when you're at, as it were, the pointy end, then to say, well, now I'm going to... <laughs> Go back down the pyramid and and broaden out again. Um, did, was it um, a risk? Did you feel at the time that you were taking a risk in doing that? Uh, I did. You know, it was a, a professional risk, certainly, um, and it is for everyone who comes to teach at St. John's because we don't have we don't have any departments. We'll go into this later. Um, you really have to give up your specialty for a while because you have to teach throughout the all required program. So as someone working on a PhD in theology, um, I had to learn to teach in the mathematics and natural sciences side of the program, for example. And so um, if you don't get tenure after a few years of doing that, you find yourself quite far behind um, and with a lot of work to do if you hope to catch up and um, you know, get yourself a, a, a more um, standard sort of tenure track position at another university. Um, I felt like it was worth the risk. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, del I'm delighted that I, took, that, I, that I took the gamble. <laughs> Simon, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your story, of how you came to be a, an advocate for liberal education. Sure, sure. Well, it's interesting because I didn't actually realize at the time but this started really for me with my own first degree at uh, the Australian National University in fact back in the 70s so you know 40 years ago more um, Emily as you as you know very well the Australian um, undergraduate degree model is different from the American one normally we take two significant discipline majors with an honors year afterwards and some extra options built in around the edges but this can actually turn into something like a great books program, or at least it could when I took it. I didn't realize this at the time, um, so it was kind of inadvertent. But this was what my degree at 
the ANU in the 70s turned into. So it was, um, it was a first year of, of Greek, English, and philosophy, and then two more years of English and philosophy. But the first year that I, that I was there, when I had the three different subjects, actually was in some ways the best of all. I had two Greek courses. Both of these were all year long in those days, annual courses. So this was like four semester courses um, for Greek. One of them was in language, and the other was called Greek civilization. Nobody minded the word civilization in those days. Um, and it was texts in translation. And we did, in that one year, we did just about all the great texts. We did the Iliad in the, in the Latin War translation. We <clears throat> read the Oresteian trilogy. We read Antigone, Medea, Thucydides and Herodotus, uh, Aristophanes. We did the clouds and the frogs. Uh, we looked at the Republic. We looked at both ethics and politics. It was just a fantastic course. And I, I still remember all the teachers with great affection and admiration. If it had been the only course I ever took, I'd still be remembering it uh, today. Uh, and then those other two majors, because I didn't continue with uh, the Greek language and civilization after first, the first year, I continued with the English and philosophy. And the philosophy, for example, brought a wonderful history of philosophy course of the kind that people just don't teach anymore. So we read Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza on the continent, and then we read Hobbes, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, the, the empiricists, mainly via big texts. Uh, we looked at the meditations, the monodology, the ethics of Spinoza, Leviathan, Locke's essay, etc., etc. And then in other units, you could read Kant's first critique and Wittgenstein's investigations, etc. So that was essentially a great works of philosophy course. And then in English, which is what I ended up taking honors in, we covered the entire waterfront over three or four years from Chaucer to the 20th century, to you know, Wallace Stevens or whatever, more or less all the greats, Spencer, Sidney, Fielding, Henry James, George Eliot, everything. So what, it, what that all added up to was that in three years, I constructed inadvertently something that you just can't build anymore, a genuine great books course within that Australian model double major degree. Uh, and then um, adjusting the constituent bits, that's more or less what I felt that the Ramsey courses could bring to 21st century Australia, as nothing like it was, in fact, available anymore. So there was all of that. And then, Stephen, just, just to the last little part of the story, much more recently, years later, I was teaching uh, at the ANU in the earlier 2000s. <laughs> so this is about 20 years ago now. And I was able to... And there was a bit of resistance to this from the faculty, from particularly the um, European languages um, department, who didn't really like the idea of doing great works in translation. But in the end, they, they assented. And I put on a course called Souls and Lives, based on a, a book of mine which was subtitled Poetry and Philosophy from Homer to Rousseau. And in fact, the course continued on to, to Proust. Um, and again, I, was, I found that I was able to make it a great books course. We, we, we read Augustine's Confessions, we read Dante's Inferno, we read a couple of Shakespeare plays, we read excerpts from The Republic, from Aristotle's Ethics, um, from Goethe's Faust, as I say, right through to, to Proust. So this worked very well in the, in the earlier 2000s. And I think I can say this without sounding immodest, the students apparently loved it. So I just, I realized putting those two experiences together that it was possible to bring back not only the idea of grappling with and mastering a truly complex work of thought from the past, which is also still our contemporary, but to string such a series of works together, not in an antiquarian spirit, but it, as, a, as a series of texts that really do speak to students and are connected to each other uh, and can be offered as a great books program over two or three years. So. So putting those two things together um, was basically what produced this idea uh, in conjunction with our conversations with people at uh, St. John's, Columbia, and so on. So, um, so there we are. That's, that's my story, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Simon, as you know, I, I was a student at the ANU in the English department uh, and, and followed a, a similar sequence of courses to the one that, that you probably followed yourself as a student. 
so I, I still have the benefit. Uh, I, I don't think students have for many years. Um, but I, I was at the tail end, I think, of, of, a, of a system where we, we did have to look at canonical authors from Chaucer through to, you know, the 20th century. Uh, and we, um, you know, we received a, a good grounding uh, in those canonical works. Um, and at the same time, I was taking uh, some units in philosophy. So I, I looked at Plato's Republic. Uh, that was coincidental because I happened to to take a unit in philosophy at the same time as I was doing English in my first year. And then I, I did some history. Um, but even, even then, notwithstanding that there was some sense of order in the sequence of English units that I was taking, I did have this, this larger sense that really uh, there was a sort of um, uh, a lack of order uh, in the in the way courses were arranged, uh, and that even though I was taking a, a sequence in the English department, um, my colleagues in other disciplines were doing their thing, and uh, never the twain shall meet um, except by by accident. And it was only really when I uh, finished my PhD and then was was lucky enough to to get a position at Campion College, and it was uh, I was the only person at that time in you know, teaching literature and was just told, well, these are the courses, you have to teach everything from Homer right through to the 20th century. It was only really then, in 2006, when I had to teach everything that I, I came to understand the importance of going back to the ancient Greeks and, as it were, working, working one's way forward. And to some extent, because we we did emphasise integration. So my colleagues in other disciplines and I would get together and, and see how we could find connections. Uh, and so even though I'm, I'm still very much um, a novice at this, you know, I, I did then have to set myself the task of reading Herodotus and reading Thucydides and um, reading Plato again. And um, But when I discovered uh, St. John's, um, uh, I, I then sort of realised that as much as it's important to integrate the humanities, it's also important to see the connection between the connections between the humanities and the sciences, which is something that mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't happen. Uh, and, and St. John's is probably unique in that respect. Um, one or two other colleges in the United States where all the students are doing the same sequence of courses across humanities and sciences but um so yeah i i um i realized very quickly that the sort of adventure that camping college was was on was part of this much larger tradition uh you know heavily influenced by liberal education um from the united states or in the united states so that's how I came to be interested in liberal education and, and specifically in, in St. John's um, because of some of the programs that St. John's itself inspired in the United States, such as Thomas Aquinas College and others, which had been, been formative for um, the formation of, of Camping College. Um, why don't we, because we've been talking about liberal education, uh, assuming that everyone knows what we're talking about, why don't we uh, look at that? Perhaps, Simon, if you could start us on that and just tell us, in your view, what liberal education is, um, what it does, how is it different from professional and, and practical education? Well, liberal arts, um, this is important because the word liberal um, is in both liberated and liberating. And the, the deep etymology of the term liberal in Latin and even Greek, which I think is um, eleutheria, Stephen, you'd know more about this, and Emily, it's in the contrast between being free and being in service of some kind. So that the, the, there's, a, there's a, a notion of being free from or being delivered from. Delivery actually has the same etymology. Um, um, delivered from the need to make a living to be kind of um, uh, in service to a wage. So the bit of your studies which is not about professional training is liberated. What you might do when you're not working, when you are free, literally in your free time. Uh, and the Proto-Indo-European root of the root term actually means both grow and people. 
So I think there's a primordial sense somewhere buried in the word of growing into being human, uh, liberation into humanity, a kind of deep emancipation is buried in the word. You, you even think of freeing the mind from the bonds of prejudice and preconception. And of course, Newman um, has much to say about this, even though his words might sound a little bit old fashioned to us now, but he talks about a habit of, I'm quoting here, a habit of mind of which the attributes are freedom, equitableness, how much we need that today, gosh, calmness, moderation, and wisdom. So um, freedom was a key, a key thing in the idea of a university for him. But then if you turn from the, the etymology to the institution, what are the liberal arts? They came into existence, as we all know, in an eerily similar form in some ways to the one they've retained, in distinction from two other more organized forms of study in the Middle Ages, almost a thousand years ago, uh, Bologna, Paris, Oxford. There was the professional training in law and medicine, which is training you to be in the service of a profession. Uh, and there was also the theological training for priests and for the church. And in that latter case, that was a binary between divinity and humanity what became the literae humani humaniores, the, the, the liberal arts, um, which was in a sense, and forgive me, Stephen, free from the shackles of religion, if you want to think about it that way, if you take, if you take a humanist sort of perspective. And then within that medieval curriculum, which lingered on into the 19th century in many places, including the early American institutions in Harvard and so on, were the sort of seeds of the modern humanities, rhetoric, grammar, logic, music, maths, astronomy, and so on. And it hung on in the oldest US colleges and in Oxbridge as a kind of education for gentlemen, you know, in classical character and virtue and forms of thought, changed in the 19th century above all by Germany, by the German university, which, which created the notion of the modern research university that then came into America with Charles Eliot in the 19th century. And that was the, the new Harvard, as it were, set the model for a, an elective liberal arts base and then a highly professionalized grad school superstructure, which kind of retained the old Bologna model, but forced the liberal arts to adapt to a new professionalizing and much more culturally diverse sort of nation. And the arrival, Emily, I think of large numbers of immigrants into the United States in the early part of the 20th century kind of breathed new life into all of that with John Erskine at Columbia and Mortimer Adler and Hutchins and so on. You know all about this the elective liberal arts program needed to be revamped so as to provide, Louis Menand says this, to provide young people from different backgrounds with a common culture that was already thin in the United States, and that became the Great Books program. So. Thank you, Simon. I mean, Emily, that seems like a, a good opportunity then to talk about uh, St John's role uh, in um, liberal in the United States, uh, and perhaps if, if you'd like, you could add to, to Simon's um, thoughts on, on liberal education. Um, but specifically, if you would, if you could tell us how it was that St. John's developed, especially the, what's called the new program, now almost 100 years old, of course, but how was it that the new program came into being and why did it come into being at St. John's when it in the um, first half of the 20th century? Yeah. Um, well, si I'll, let me see what I can do to, to pull these things together. Simon, you have uh, given a wonderful uh, sort of summary of um, what one might say in answer to the question of, you know, what what is liberal education? Um, the the um, the motto of St. John's College that's um, on the seal of the college is um, in English. We make free adults out of children by means of books and a balance. So again, that emphasis on freedom and the emphasis on freedom for. So what's the talos of education? What are we going to make? Are we going to make doctors and engineers or and um, people who have all sorts of different um, important skill sets? Or are we going to make free human beings, free adults? And I think liberal education is an education that is aimed toward the education of, of full human beings and regards um, the students as not as potential members of a particular profession, but as potential um, human beings who are going to participate 
in society broadly, right, who have an aesthetic side and who are going to participate in um, the civic life of the polity in which they live and who are going to um, perhaps be involved in um, scientific research or perhaps be involved in um, scholarship of a different sort in uh, philosophy or something, but it's the, it's the education of the whole human being, I think, um, that, li that uh, liberal education aims at. St. John's came out of the movement that, um, that Simon is describing, as we all know, John Erskine uh, in Columbia in the um, 1920s, developing the new program. He worked with um, Mortimer Adler, with um, Hutchinson from um, University of Chicago. We, um, Mortimer Adler and uh, Stringfellow Barr and Scott Buchanan and um, Hutchins came together to um, start, the new, start the new program at St. John's. The new program started in 1937. Um, it was a combination of uh, a great deal of idealism and um, some really uh, hard-nosed practicality. The college that is St. John's College and was founded initially in um, 1697 as King Williams as the King William School uh, was on the brink of uh, closing. Really, it was um, financially it was it was going under financially, and um, it had been a sort of um, military school, uh, and as a way of saving it. Uh, Bar and Stringfellow Bar and Scott Buchanan came in with the model from um, Columbia and Chicago and suggested beginning what they called the new program and gave the faculty at the old college the choice of staying or leaving. And they um, put together an all required program, is, um, which is which it remains today, which is extraordinarily unusual, right? There's no students are not allowed to um, major in maths or English or philosophy. Every student takes every part of the program. There are no departments. All the faculty teach in the entire program, which is only fair, actually, if we're going to ask the students to um, participate in all aspects of the program. Um, Going back to something that I think um, Stephen and Simon, you were both talking about earlier, one of the things that convinced me that I was on the right track when I first um, landed at St. John's was the excitement that I not only felt myself, but that I felt in the classroom, um, reading Homer and Plato with 18 year olds who had really no no experience in this, no real preparation for, for, for reading these texts. Um, and who, when they, read, when they read them, found that they were asking questions that were their own deepest questions. Um, and that they could uh, converse with these books without the sort of intermediary uh, apparatus that um, a lot of secondary sources and, and scholarship adds that's valuable in itself in its own way for, um, you know, learning more about the texts and their origins and so forth. But for really encountering the questions that these texts raise, just reading the text, there's, there's, no, there's no substitute for simply sitting down and reading the text. And in the classroom with a bunch of students, even if the text is Euclid, even if it's a mathematical text, or it's Aristotle talking about parts of animals, the excitement was just palpable. How true all that sounds to me. I mean, these, these are the most articulate and profound minds in many cases that we've known of for 2000 years, the ones which have been so formative of our own minds. How can they possibly not leave a deep impression on a group of students sitting around discussing them? I mean, it's, um, you know, in a way, I'm just thinking, Emily, of the word character, which also sounds so old fashioned, but a, a character is, is literally an, an imprint, a mark that a, a, a stylus leaves on a, on a piece of a tapestry of wax, you know, and, and the idea that a, a degree can build character seems so old fashioned. And yet at the same time, it totally isn't. Because the impression, the marks that the, the marks that these books leave on the minds of impressionable people, are, are just 
can, can never be can never be um, can never be erased. The, these are, these aren't just any old books, right? They're 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 what Trilling calls real, real books. I mean, they're they're, they're dense with reality and therefore formative in a way that uh, that very few other books have been. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted, but I just uh, just that, what what you were saying and made me think. About. No, that's that's really interesting. It seems another thing I think that's uh, you know so important about reading these books is that you know they're the books that have constructed the world in which we all are now living. Um, you know, and, and sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. Even they are the books that uh, from which the presuppositions come. Uh, the, the world, you know, the, the world we all inhabit is are built upon. And so when you go back to the sources of those ideas and you see the questions and you see them arise, you really become more aware of who you are and what your own cultural inheritance is. And you become able to think about it much more deliberately rather than simply um, accepting it. When you actually become able to, to be, I think, more open and more critical and more exploratory because you can really think about these ideas and sort of instead of them just being sort of the ideas that flow through you as a person born into a more or less western worldview in the 20th or 21st century absolutely, absolutely. can i can i just one one more stephen this is Forgive me, I just, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, a, a key thought here, surely, going back to those binaries that we talked about, the liberal versus the professional and the liberal versus the theological, surely it's a fundamental binary in knowledge itself. I mean, is it functional? Is it a means? Or is it sometimes an end in itself? And what does it mean to say that it's an end in itself? Well, like we were saying, it means that it's mind formative rather than mind instrumental. Um, not using the mind as a given tool to do something with, but actually changing the tool itself, changing its, its format and its scope, making it bigger or richer or better, enlarging the spirit, you know, all of that. So, and, and, you know, maybe that enlargement makes it more fit for what you might call making sense of life, finding meaning in life, in the life that we have outside of just making a living which is, you know, actually a spiritual task. As, as Anthony Cronman says in his marvellous book, Education's End, came out a few years ago, a task that I honestly believe that the modern humanities departments in universities, on the whole, are failing to do, where it ought to be their main responsibility. So th this is part of what we at Ramsey are trying to address, something like an impoverishment of spirit in the modern humanities in the universities. So anyway, sorry, Stephen, forgive me. I just wanted to get all of that off my chest. <laughs> no, <absolutely. laughs> it's, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful discussion. And uh, Emily, you, you've mentioned the focus at St. John's on primary texts. Um, I, I wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit more and also talk, talk us through the, the structure of the the program, let's say the undergraduate program, uh, and also, uh, you know, we've, we've been having a, a conversation. I mean, what? Tell us something about the pedagogical um, underpinnings of St John's. Why the focus on discussion rather than say uh, the lecturer at the front of the room speaking for an hour to to list, to listening students? Why discussion? Even as you said that the students come in not knowing much. Why, why should we sit around listening to these students telling us their thoughts on Plato's Republic? <laughs> These are good questions. Um, the, the, the program is structured um, over, over four years. I'll, I'll start with that. Um, the first year, roughly speaking, um, is grounded in, um, in, the, in the classical Greek world, um, in the seminar in which um, read a lot of literature and philosophy, um, Homer, Plato, Aristotle, a, a great many uh, of the Greek um, plays in mathematics, 
um, almost the entirety of the 13 books of Euclid's Elements. Um, in the natural sciences, um, we try to go back to the fundamental beginnings of three different types of science, so life sciences, um, what we would now call physics, and what we would now call chemistry. So we um, start with um, Aristotle and the life sciences, parts of animals and on the soul. We start with um, Archimedes in physics, um, looking at problems having to do with levers and buoyancy. And then we have to um, jump forward quite a bit and we start with um, Lavoisier in, in chemistry. Um, but the point in that part of the program is to take the students back to the place where the fundamental questions that ground each of those areas of the sciences are being asked. Um, and then in the, um, in the language class in that, in that year, the students are learning ancient Greek. And by the end of that year, they are translating a bit of um, Platonic dialogue. You know, together. Sophomore year is more disparate. Um, it covers, um, it, going to back to um, some of the legacy of Leo Strauss for a moment, um, the dichotomy between Athens and Jerusalem. We go back to pick up on um, the Jerusalem side of that. Um, at the beginning of the sophomore year. The students read um, a great deal of the Hebrew Bible and New Testament. Um, they then read some of, uh, some of the Romans, they read Virgil, um, they read Tacitus. Um, and then uh, they move, they begin to move toward the 20th, uh, move toward modernity. They read um, Dante that year, um, Augustine, Aquinas, um, a, lot of, a lot of theology. Um, they continue learning Greek in the, in the language tutorial. The mathematics is, I think, really exciting that year. They do um, a lot of um, ancient astronomy, starting with Ptolemy, doing the mathematics around the equations having to do with the sun going around the Earth. And you might go, well, what on Earth? is, you know, why, what's the value of that? Well, I mean, first of all, that's what it looks like. And Ptolemy's, um, Ptolemy's calculations still work. If you want to know, you know, what time the sun's going to be coming up or what constellations are going to be at one place or another in the sky, his assumptions aren't our assumptions, but it's very interesting that um, he was able to put together an entire system um, to account for the movements of the heavenly bodies. Then we go to Copernicus and ask questions like, well, if Ptolemy and Copernicus are both accounting for movements, what makes one system better than the other? Why would you choose one or the other if you didn't have um, you know, a telescope or something at, um, to give you um, more information about what's actually going on? Um, so we, we move through we move through that a sequence there. Then we do um, early questions about the millions. And um, we end with the emergence of, of algebra, looking at um, analytic geometry, so that we're able to look at some questions that we studied um, in the con in the conics of Apollonius and see how they're treated again by Descartes um, in analytic geometry. And that was students become aware that there are different approaches to mathematics and that mathematics is a subject like the subjects in the humanities in which there are different ways to approach the same problem and better and worse answers and trade-offs and um, where beauty and elegance and um, efficiency are all different sorts of things that you think about. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot that's going on there that's really interesting. The students, um, instead of a, instead of a scientific um, study that year, the students spend an entire year um, studying music. They learn to sing together. Um, they learn to read music. They learn a bit of music theory. Um, and by the end of the year, they're analyzing together um, usually the St. Matthew Passion of, um, of um, J.S. Bach um, and a Mozart opera and then some other um, musical texts that are chosen by the, by the class along with the, with the tutor. And it's amazing. The ability of all of the students to sing together is one of the uh, things that strikes 
almost everyone when they visit St. John's as, um, as sort of magical. The, the song that all the students know and love to sing together is um, a motet by Palestrina, Secret Jervis. And um, they, they learn it as freshmen actually, and they continue to sing it. They sing it together at graduation as part of their graduation celebration. It, it, it seems to me that, that, that one um, uh, dimension of what you're talking about is the fostering of a real cohort spirit um, I yes. mean, nothing, nothing, yeah. can, nothing can be better than singing together, obviously, but, but even speaking together around a literary text as opposed to singing a musical text together has the same impact if they're doing it together over a period of years, right? That's right. It's the most intense um, and um, sort of deliberate in intellectual community you can possibly imagine. And you can go into the coffee shop and make a remark about... Aristotle or about um, ancient astronomy or about, you know, the St. Matthew Passion. And you've instantly got a conversation going because other people know those texts as well. And that's true of faculty as well as students. So everything just sort of spills out. And, mm -hmm. and it also connects each generation to the one before it and the one after it, doesn't it? That's right. So that That's right. So the alumni and the students also they, they share a, a very very strong bond. So previous generations of St John's students would know exactly what the current generation was going through, and they could talk to them, etc. Right? Yeah. That's right. There have been you know it's not yeah. like the, the, the it changes a little bit. The, the program a changes little a little bit, but it doesn't change much. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I did want to ask one thing which you hear overwhelmingly from teachers and students in Australian universities, which is the social media problem um, and the limited attention span problem that seems to go hand in hand with that. So how do you, I mean, it sounds like you've already given us part of the answer, but how do you discourage young people from spending too much of their time looking at the screen uh, or not spending enough time reading a long and complex text? I mean, do they read whole books? How, how does that work? How, does, how do you encourage them to do that? You know, they, they do read whole books. That's um, the amazing thing. It seems to me that you know, in any given class, sure, there may be one or two people who didn't get the reading done for that night. But on the whole, because the classes consist entirely of discussion, and because if the students aren't prepared, the classes are not interesting, because the professor, the, we call them tutors, but the, the tutor isn't going to rescue the class. They'll ask some additional questions, some prodding. But if people haven't read and don't have good things to say, then um, eventually everyone's going to be just, you know, stuck in a class that's really, really boring for two hours. <laughs> and so there's a lot of positive peer pressure <laughs> to, to do the reading. Okay. Um, that's, it's very that's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's part that's of what's actually, good that's, about that's, the discussion model. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, absolutely. That is, that is fascinating because um, Stephen and I have both sat in on classes at St. John's in, in amazement at how well they work. And something that, um, uh, as, as an outsider, you're not necessarily all that used to, although we all try to achieve it, is this phenomenon of the tutor not saying very much at all. Um, but but, but just, just asking the one right question, maybe a couple of times in the, in the hour and a half, or whatever it is, and away it goes. And, and how, how do you do that? <laughs> it's, I, I, I have two things to say to that, which are going to sound a little bit like they're in contradiction. And I think they're both true. So maybe you can help me figure out how they stay together. One is that I think there's a very strong culture at St. John's um, of, of, of doing this. So the students come in, you know, the 18-year-olds, and they have the sophomores, juniors, and seniors above them who are telling them, no, this is how it works. This is what you're supposed to do. No, really, your tutor is not supposed to be telling you what the answer is. You're mm -hmm. supposed to be having a good conversation. 
Um, yep. when, when I'm leading a class, I tend to ask myself, sometimes I get overly excited and then I jump in and talk too much, but I, I try <laughs> to ask myself, <laughs> am I going to make this conversation actually better by coming in right now? I mean, I could make it different for sure, but am I going to make it better? Um, and if I doesn't seem clear to me that I'm going to make it better, I, I, I try not to, I try not to join. So that's one thing. I think the strong culture makes it, um, you know, supports it and makes it possible. But then, and I found this out more as I've become more involved with the graduate program, where there's less time and students are not, you know, immersed in, you know, 24 hours a day in the culture of the place. Um, I, I think this is something that people, or at least many people, deeply long to do, and they don't feel like they have permission to do it. At least I find that with a lot of the graduate students. They read the books because we ask them, and then they come in and they want to talk about them, but they feel like probably the tutor ought to be telling them things about it. And once they get the idea that, no, that really isn't what we're going to do, there's a lot of a lot of joy, um, I think, for them in discovering that their own ideas are valued not only by the tutor, but by their by their colleagues, and that together they're building something. So, so really, it's um, the entire mindset towards reading, conversation, teaching, what those things actually are, is different. I think it is. I feel very lucky because, yeah, it's not, you know, it's the most, um, you know, fulfilling, exciting sort of, you know, teaching that I can imagine. Well, you know, it is it is so interesting, Emily and Stephen. Uh, sorry, I jumped in, Stephen. I'm sure you had another question, but this is this is so interesting. I just wanted to say this. It links to something else, kind of quite fundamental for me. In in a way. We're talking, I think, about a different model of knowledge, of thinking, uh, even in a sense of self-formation. You know, it's different from what we're used to at the university level in arts faculties in Australia and, and I believe in the United States as well. The attitude is, I mean, you've talked about this, you talk about graduate students coming in with the approach that they expect academics to teach them stuff. Um, to teaching is research based and the idea is the student comes into class to hear from someone who's spent a lifetime or many many years on this particular research topic which they're just going to tell you about and that is not the only model or even always necessarily the best one and and I think this is what St John's is doing so much to address and and offer an alternative to anyway don't you agree <laughs> Well, I was just going to come in then and say, Simon, you, you mentioned earlier that sometime back in the conversation that, uh, you know, as distinct from a program like St. John's where it's required, the whole program is required of everyone. Yeah, required. That, you know, students basically get to pick and choose what they take now. But, but as you've just um, suggested, in fact, often those choices themselves are chosen for them in a way by the research model of the university. That is that they're choosing courses from within a range that is determined by the research interests of the faculty. And that, that starts really from, the, from their first year uh, at university. And even, even within disciplines, uh, you know, within, within English, even though once you would have had your area of focus, you would have nonetheless been expected to be able yeah. to teach across a much teach outside. Range. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but increasingly that's that's no longer the case. And and so it's not just that students are choosing uh, and that universities seem to be creating niche programs for what they perceive to be student demand, um, but, but rather that it's uh, the research model that dictates what is taught to undergraduates. And, and so uh, as the profession grows as there are more and more PhDs, as there is more and more scholarship, 
uh, there is less and less focus on uh, a core curriculum uh, and on, on fundamental texts. Uh, it, it seems to be effective of time as much as anything else and that one thing that a core curriculum like the one at St John's achieves is actually to uh, not, um, as it were, restrict things from growing, but basically say, well, you know, we're never going to be in a situation as a civilization where we shouldn't read Homer just because there's more and more scholarship in other areas and we divert our attention to that, that Homer and Plato and the Old and the New Testaments and, and whatever it is, that those things remain fundamental and that we need to know them, we need to discuss them. Uh, and at, at the same time as we believe that knowledge advances, um, that advancement can paradoxically lead us to become very myopic and, and you know, short-sighted. Ab absolutely. I mean, the paradox is that what looks like a restrictive core is actually liberating. Yeah. It sort of li it liberates you from infinite choice, right? I mean, in, in fact, um, Emily, I was going to ask you, uh, this is really coming at this from the <clears throat> perspective of the tutors, the teachers, as much as from the perspective of the students. I mean, it's, it would be almost unthinkable in the current Australian context to have a whole college full of people who are not required to do research. Here, here the model is that everybody is assumed to be on a 40, 40, 20 um, time division where 40% of their time is research, 40% is teaching, and the other 20 is admin. <clears throat> and most of the tutors at St. John's do not are not put under pressure to produce research, right? They're very contented, essentially being 100% teaching, right? Um, yeah, that's right. And it's, you know, it's almost unheard of in the American context as well. Um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it really is very unusual. It, the college does demand it because in your first, you know, in your, in your first years, especially, you're teaching outside of your area of specialization all the time. So you don't have time to do your research. You are busy learning how to do something completely different. And um, I mean, you're, you're excited and you're, you know, you're learning from your colleagues. Um, so colleagues who, you know, my, you know, my colleagues who have um, advanced degrees in different subject areas will lead groups in which um, tutors who don't have degrees in that area, you know, we'll get together over the summer, or we'll get together over the course of a year and work on things together, you know, continue our own learning. But it's all really learning in service of being able to, um, to teach this program. You know, there's, there's no research expectation. Stephen, I've gazumped your question, so I'm sure you want to go back to those. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering, because we've been singing the, the praises of, of the discussion method, and yet I imagine that, uh, as students ourselves, we didn't really encounter it, at least not to the extent that a student at St. John's encounters it. So I'm wondering um, what we've talked about its virtues, what are its virtues, if you could expand on that a little bit, uh, but also how does, it, how does it all fit in? How does St. John's fit into the larger landscape of, of higher education, given that presumably some of these students from St. John's go on to do graduate study at, at, at other institutions and, and some of them go on in turn to become experts in their field and, and teaching at other places uh, where they're expected to, to give lectures and so on. I'm just wondering how it all fits in and also perhaps how it fits into our own experience as as students and teachers ourselves uh, with with other modes of teaching, like lecturing and so on. Um, St. John sends... Um a large, a large percentage of its students on to do advanced graduate work. Um, I don't know where we are, you know, in this particular year, but usually we're within the top, you know, two percent of the num the percentage of our undergraduates who go on to do advanced degrees. Um, and so, you know, yes, they uh, they go on and study something specific, and they do they do specialized research. One of the things I found as someone coming to St. John's with an already established, you know, area of specialization is that my engagement with the authors that I had been studying was um, deepened immensely by the work I did at St. John's because the 
authors that I had been studying had themselves been immersed in this tradition and knowing it more fully enabled me to um, to understand better, you know, what 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 they were saying. Twain, you know, Emmanuel Levinas, 20th century philosopher, I understood his work better um, through having engaged in the program at St. John's. I, you know, I think our students, wherever they go, try to uh, bring along some of the pedagogy and some of the focus on uh, reading great books directly. Um, you know, when you find them all over the place, doing slightly unusual things and trying it, trying it out and seeing how far they can push things. Um, but they do, they, they do very well in academia um, in, a, in a variety of different places. And Emily, the discussion method itself, and even the, the focus on the great books, that's, uh, Dons has been able to influence secondary education significantly in the United States, at least within the, the classical school movement. Is, it, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, yeah, that's right. Um, a, a lot of classical teachers are educated in the Graduate Institute. Um, a lot of St. John's teacher, a lot of St. John's students, undergraduate students go into classical teaching. There's a, there's a robust conversation going on, um, I think, between St. John's and the classical education movement. Is that true with the Ramsey Center in Australia as well? Is there a classical um, education? The there, classical there is a... Yeah. Sorry, go on, sorry. Go on, go on. No, you, you go, you're right. The classical education movement in Australia is, is, is very young and it's taking its lead from the movement in the United States. Uh, there are a number of um, new initiatives at the moment um, new schools that are, that are starting that are endeavouring to, to adopt a classical curriculum. It's a little bit, I think it's harder in Australia because of government requirements uh, than it is in the United States um, to, to get these off the ground. And uh, actually that, that's true also at the tertiary level. It, it's, it's a harder proposition in Australia to start a new liberal arts college and um, there are various um, government bodies that, that um, get involved fairly early in questions of pedagogy even and um, curriculum design. So uh, even I think starting something like St John's in Australia would be a difficult task. Um, so yes, there there is a there's a movement at the secondary level, there's a movement at the tertiary level um, to adopt great books and discussion method. Uh, and, but yes, they're taking their lead from, from the US. Yes, I think what you're saying, Stephen, is right. Uh, and partly it has to do with the fact that an institution like St. John's has existed for nearly 100 years. Uh, and this, the, the classical movement that you're talking about in Australia is very nascent, very early, uh, and also on a much smaller scale. Um, Australia is, only, is a much smaller country in terms of population than the US, and also with an education bureaucracy and policy that is more centralized. And so permissions are more difficult to obtain. Uh, variety is a bit more difficult to establish, uh, which is partly why the Ramsey Centre has decided to partner with existing universities rather than try to create a new St. John's type or Campion type um, uh, model. I mean, there's lots of reasons um, deeply buried in the history of the development of the Australian tertiary education system ar around all of this. But in a nutshell, I guess that's, that's mostly why it is but uh, all the more reason to be so excited by what you have to tell us and by the prospect. I've only got one more question I'd like to ask, if that's, um, if that's all right, Simon and Emily. Uh, and, and that is, uh, this is the fun part. It's been a very funny interview, but this is the fun part. <laughs> um, what's the book that you've most enjoyed teaching? Hard question. So many wonderful books um, in... Uh, that I'm reading sort of on a, on a regular basis. I think, you know, I, al I always, always um, enjoy and, and, and am enriched by, by reading Dante because of the, 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 the bringing together of poetry and philosophy and, and just sort of everything in a, in a, in a whole worldview, it's sort of the, uh, the creation of an, of an entire universe there, um, just the beauty of it, the depth of it. Um, always 
it's, it strikes me with wonder every single time. Um, you could probably tell by the way I talk about it that although it's not my background, um, the mathematics and science side of things at St. John's has um, given me um, an amazing amount of, um, you know, personal, personal joy. And I also love teaching it because um, so many students come into our program, and this is true of both the graduate and the undergraduate program, having self-selected a long time ago and having said to themselves, I'm not a math person, I can't do math. Um, and then when they get exposed to this, um, to these books, which they don't have any choice about, they find that really they are math people. It's just the way that mathematics has been taught to them. It's just, it was presented to them as something where you just memorize some formulas, you plug things in, you get the right answer or the wrong answer. And, you know, it, it, it they, sh they shut down. But when they see the questions that are being addressed and the beautiful ways in which um, really seminal thinkers are thinking about them, um, it opens it opens people up. And so I, I love seeing that. And so in that way, it's one of my favorite teaching experiences. Thank you, Emily. Simon, what's yours? Well, um, so I'll stay away from the maths side because I don't do that. And it's I, I, I'd so much like to, having heard you on the subject, Emily, it's, it sounds fascinating. But I usually think in terms of that the three primary colors of the humanities, the three core modes of thought, are philosophy, literature, and history. To me, that seems like mm -hmm. the heart of the thing. So, so I'll pick one from each. And as far as history concern, is concerned, it's Thucydides by a mile. I just, I just don't know any other book which manages to make um, politics sound like drama tragedy. I mean, it's a tragic book. It's the tragedy of what happens to democracy when it experiences hubris. And it's just nobody's ever done that like him. It, it, I, I, I just never tire of that book. Um, so that's one. In philosophy, um, I actually, I'm deeply fond of Wittgenstein's investigations, because it is such a subversive book. And you almost get to the end of it and think it's, it's undermined philosophy from the, absolutely from the foundations, and yet at the same time re, revived and rejuvenated and, and uh, it, it made it new. So I, I just think that's a fabulous book. And in terms of the literature, well, you know, I've taught Shakespeare for years and years and years, so what can you say? Um, but but rather, than, rather, than, um, rather than say Shakespeare, I actually, if, if it had to be one book, it's, it's a work of, it's a novel in translation, and it's War and Peace, which you mentioned early on, Emily, and I find it hard to avoid the cliche that it's the greatest novel that's ever been written, and there's, there's just, it's inexhaustible. Even if you skip those rather dreary pieces where Tolstoy gives you the benefit of his theory of history and so on and so forth, which are a bit boring, um, they're a minority part of the whole novel, and it just, it just has everything. It's just fantastic. Yeah, that's my favorite. I agree. <laughs> it's, one of those, it's one of those with the whole world just in the book. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And maybe it's a good, maybe given what's going on in uh, international affairs right now, it's not a bad moment to remember that Russia is the most extraordinary, rich, deep, fascinating culture. Stephen, what about yours? Stephen, what are you here? Yeah, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It changes, obviously, as, as, as we all know. Uh, the, the Odyssey at the moment. Um, and uh, in particular, I'm moved by the, the recognition scenes. Uh, Odysseus, uh, rec when he's recognised by his son, Polemicus, when he's, you know, the, the wonderful episode where um, Penelope questions him. And he um, proves that he's... he's her uh, real husband, um, but the one that's often overlooked is the, the recognition scene with his father at the end when he um, explains to his father that uh, he's sure I can show you the scar on my on my ankle. But, um, uh, the other thing I can do is name all the trees. Uh, you taught me the names of these trees when I was a boy, and so you think this monumental twenty-four book epic with all the bloodshed and all the adventures. 
and yet it, it, in a way it, it sort of comes down to something very intimate and personal um, between a father and a son. And so it's the way in which Odysseus is revealed as a son, uh, as a father, as a husband, uh, that I find just so compelling. And uh, as I get older, much more interesting than all of the things that interested me when I was younger, <laughs> you know, the Stiller and Charybdis or the Cyclops and so on. But it's those scenes with his um, son, his wife and his father that, that just get me now. <laughs> and Stephen, isn't there, a, isn't there a recognition with a dog? Yes, Argos, yes. that's a beautiful scene, of course. And, and also yeah. with his nurse, Euryclea. Um, yeah, yeah the, the scene with Argos is... Uh, unbelievable. unbelievable. Just, it brings brings tears to your yeah. eyes, I know. It's true. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's just the thud of the tail. You know, he looks yeah. up, the thud of the tail, and then he, he dies. He yeah. dies. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, that, that is something. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler alert, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I and mean, we, we all know what it's like to come home, you know, after a day in the office or whatever, and to be greeted by one's spouse and one's children, one's parents, or a dog, in fact. So, you know, mm. whenever, I, whenever I'm reading that with the students, they all are moved by those scenes. Um, yeah. I find at different stages in life, different ones grab you more. And this is the other thing that the great books do. They they keep interpreting us as we interpret them. Yeah. Well, I, sadly, I think we're coming to the end, not just of the Odyssey, but of our, um, of our time conversation today. Um, so really, it remains only, Emily, for me to thank you warmly for giving us so much of your time and the benefit of your wisdom and telling us about um, St. John's. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Perhaps we might be able to see you again in Annapolis or even in Sydney before too long. Thank you so much for joining us, Emily Langston. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, to, our, to our listeners, thank you for joining me and Stephen McInerney talking to Dr. Emily Langston today. Uh, this is Simon Haynes saying goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.